Hello, and welcome to part two of this three-part series on three things everyone needs to know about PFAS. Hope you're enjoying the video series. You don't need to see part one to see this uh, part two, um, but it does have a lot of good information, and if you enjoy this, you should watch part one. The link will be at the end. And like all YouTubers, please subscribe to uh, this channel. It helps me out a lot. It helps me prove to people that um, people watching this are engaged and that it's worth, um, worth my time. So today, part two of the three things you need to know about PFAS, we are talking about bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is really as simple as it sounds. Bio meaning life accumulate, meaning to gather things. Um, one definition said to gather into a pile, which I like. Um, but it's life accumulating things from the environment. So in this case, um, it mostly refers to um, over time that we will accumulate something. Uh, a good example of this is DDT. So early on, DDT was seen as this just wonder chemical. Uh, we were having big problems with malaria worldwide, um, especially soldiers were having problems in World War II with diseases caused by lice and mites. Um, there was diseases caused by mosquitoes. And what they found was this brand new chemical, this brand new promising chlorinated chemical, you could dump it and it would kill all of the insects and it would last for a really long time. So you could apply to, I saw a paper, um, they were saying leaves of an apple tree and the leaves would be protected even a year later because this stuff is so persistent. Remember part one is persistence. Um, what they didn't know about DDT would be um, what I, I'll talk about in a few slides, obviously this section's on bioaccumulation, they, did, they didn't really know all this at first. Um, they just thought it was great and they thought, well, the toxicity seems low, it doesn't overtly kill people. Um, we've got a picture here of it looks like, looks exactly like Forrest Gump getting directly sprayed with lice control and I was getting real itchy, you know, and they sprayed me with some stuff. They called it the DDT. Um, and I think Forrest Gump was Vietnam War, not World War II. Uh, I found another picture of a, uh, they call this um, like a fly strip or something. It wasn't a sticky one. It was actually a piece of cardboard. Um, and if you, I, I zoomed in there, so hopefully you can see a piece of par cardboard guaranteed 100% impregnated, um, meaning impregnated with DDT. So this is Cox's parrot. You could hang it in your house and it says, uh, perch me in your room and I will kill all the flies. Um, and I think that's very ironic that they used a parrot of all things because a few years later, so this would have been in the 1940s, a few years later in 1951, there was a paper published by Alan Bitten showing um, bird mortality from DDT applications. This is one of the first papers that said, uh, this, this is what I call like the uh-oh moments. This was maybe the first little uh-oh moment for DDT. And when the first kind of issues were being found with DDT, this was the heyday of 3M and DuPont, Scotchgard, and Teflon coming into the market. Um, things like this ad, amazing new concept in cooking, nothing sticks to Happy Pan. So with Happy Pan, um, even though this kind of issue is going on with DDT, um, those environmental uh, consequences weren't really thought about yet. And one of the big changes that happened was in 1962, of course, Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. And Silent Spring was, you know, one of these, again, a seminal work. This is one of the things that really kicked off the environmental movement in the 60s. Um, so again, this is happening. This is DDT coming to the front. This is a little bit of chemophobia starting in our society, whereas before it was just like, great, chemicals, medicine, give it, give it all to us. We didn't really understand the problems. So back to PFAS, Donald Taves was a dental researcher. Now, again, this is a big gear shift. Why are we talking about a dental researcher? But you think about dentistry and you think about teeth and white teeth and cavity prevention, um, they knew fluoride is very important. 
So these researchers were trying to figure out what are the levels of fluoride in human blood? What are good levels? What's high? What's low? And when they were doing this, they were confused because they kept finding an organic source of fluorine. So that's instead of just free fluorine, just dissolved in your blood, they found that fluorine was covalently bound to carbon. And that's a little weird because co covalently bound to carbon shouldn't like, I like I mentioned in, uh, was that the persistence or the history one, that shouldn't really happen in the environment, right? And so they were confused. One of the first things they did here was they contacted 3M. Um, they knew that 3M had fluorochemicals. This, it wasn't a secret. The patents are public. The patents are out there. Um, you know that companies are making fluorochemicals. So the grad student, um, who's the grad student? Warren Guy contacted 3M and that's all recorded in uh, public, now public documents uh, made public in the state of Minnesota versus 3M. These are all available online. They're very interesting. Um, so that was actually, even though they discovered that in 68, they first contacted 3M in 1975. So we've let seven years go by. So seven years go by, DDT's long gone, we know about lead, we've got a handle on things as we think as far as what's persistent, what's not, what's a problem and what's not. Um, and what they did and what 3M found is actually P they didn't have a handle on PFOS at all. It was a surprise to 3M. It was, it, it was again, one of these like <laughs> Scooby-Doo rat row moments. Um, they found the levels of PFOS, one of the PFAS chemicals, in the blood of their workers a thousand times higher than in the general, general public. So now the thoughts, the wheels are spinning like, oh, okay, what does this mean? Does this mean that everybody's contaminated? Is that a bad thing? Is, are these toxic? The, the work just wasn't there. The data wasn't there. They didn't really know we would be exposed this much. So they didn't really do the te toxicity studies before then. Um, but starting in 1975, this set off a huge series of events at 3M. Again, all documented in that lawsuit I mentioned of 3M doing testing of their workers, testing of the general public, toxicity testing with rats, with other organisms. And 3M started to get a handle on the scope of what was going on here. This GCMS method for PFAS was not that good and it was not that strong of a method. It wasn't until the 1980s where they really were able to develop some good solid technology. John Finn, uh, very, very famous, won a Nobel Prize for his work in electrospray mass spectrometry. And PFAS didn't behave like the DDTs and the PCBs and the metals. There were not analytical techniques that really worked for them. But this technology made it possible. And there's John with his beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, I would love to run something like that. That just looks so much fun with all the switches and everything. That's also a great bow tie, John. Uh, shout out to my own company, Cyax, 1989. Uh, Cyax developed the API-3, the first commercial dedicated LCM SMS system. Um, this is one of the first uh, electrospray systems that you could buy. And this would allow the kind of work that you would need to say what are the concentrations in PFAS in blood down to a good level with very good specificity. Um, so they were one of the early ones to adopt this technology. Um, but in 2000, 3M came out and said, we're voluntarily phasing this out. Um, and if you look at their internal documents, they have a lot of evidence to support this. If you look at the literature, the literature is pretty scant up to this point. So it really it implies that 3M was doing this work the whole time and finally made the decision, like we're phasing this out because um, it's, it, it's not good, right? So that marks 50 years until the phase out from the, from the height of production in the 1950s to 2000, 2001 was the phase out. Um, this is a lot of time that just kind of uninhibited pumping of PFOS into the environment. And PFOA, since it still was used for a long time after this, um, still going into the environment. 2001, another paper from 3M out there that really kind of helped this field of science. Again, 3M doing the right thing scientifically. Um, they really helped the science. This was um, an ESI LCMS, so that's the technology I mentioned a second ago. They used the technology, they developed some methods, and they said, here's the best way to do it. Immediately after they did that, um, Gizzi and Kanan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, published this paper 
uh, that just really, this is our last kind of uh-oh moment of the, of the um, literature here. But this is showing the paper that showed global distribution. They looked in the Canadian Arctic. They looked in the Midwest. They looked in the Mediterranean, the Baltic. They, they found PFAS were everywhere. They were in fish. They were in uh, mammals. They were, they were just everywhere. They also found something scary, which was biomagnification. So just like I mentioned for mercury, just like I mentioned for DDT, as they moved up the food chain, the concentrations moved up as well. They found a biomagnification factor of 22, meaning something that something an organism would have levels 22 times higher than the prey that it's eating. Um, and based on literature even today, that seems pretty close to the real value, somewhere between 5 and 50 as that biomagnification factor. Um, and this work was also kind of de debated because PFAS didn't fit the models of previous compounds. It didn't act like DDT. It doesn't, you know, it, it's an acid. It's different than DDT. So when people theoretically predicted PFAS, it behaved differently in the environment than how they predicted it. So they thought it was wrong. Um, all so after that paper there have just been numerous this field kind of exploded after then and now we know how widespread pfas are they're detected in something like 99 percent of people um we know about their bioaccumulation we know their biomagnification and it is just such an important part of the risk assessment the fact that they accumulate um that it really provides a lot of the um a lot of the needed evidence to have concern about PFAS for environmental and public health. So I'll we'll close with this here. This is my dog, Puppy Paul. This is Paul Dog um, and Paul's Water. Um, a little study by the Environmental Working Group showed that levels in pets are two to three times higher than their owner, um, with average levels in humans in the U.S. being like one to five parts per billion in your blood. We assume Paul's sitting at like five to 20. The amazing part of this, even though humans one to five PPB or higher, um, the average in our water is actually very low. Most drinking water tests out below 0.07 PPB. So we're looking at like, again, uh, 20 times, 50 times, uh, even maybe a hundred times higher in our bodies than what we're eating and what we're exposed to. Also implies some multiple sources out there. Um, so this is the, this is the true take home of PFAS, three things, everything needs to know. Part two, bioaccumulation. We are sponges that soak this stuff up. Animals are even plants. Um, that is the very important aspect of PFAS. So hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you tune in for next time, which will be part three. It'll be the last part of this series. And again, if you haven't check out the other videos and please subscribe. Thank you. Bye.